Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. We're going to get started in about five minutes to give any latecomers the chance to jump in. Thanks again for joining everyone. We're gonna get, get started in just a minute.
Okay, let's get started. Thanks again for joining me today. I'm Danny Stein. I'm the operations manager here at Catapult Network. For those of you who aren't familiar with Catapult, the company was founded in 2015 to end the experience needed requirement for entry level jobs. We work primarily with recent college graduates who are excited to start their professional careers in almost any industry you can imagine. Because our focus is on transferable skills rather than experience, we're able to open doors that are otherwise closed to recent grads. We firmly believe that the skills you develop during your degree program are just as valuable as experience in entry-level roles. When the pandemic hit so close to the end of spring semester, a lot of seniors and college career centers began reaching out to us to see what kind of tips we might be able to offer for finding a job in the current climate. So we wanted to make this webinar available to anyone who might find it useful. For those of you who are joining me live, I'll send you a link to the recording once we posted it so that you can refer back to it later. I'll also send you some resources for working through some of that information that we'll go over today. If you didn't pre-register, then feel free to send in your email to info at catapultnetwork.com if you do want access to some of those resources. A little bit about me quickly, I've been working with Catapult for about two and a half years. When I started here, I was looking to make a career change from working in the candy and pastry industry, and I needed to find a company that valued the skills that I already had and who could see how those skills would translate into the business world. When I found Catapult, it was obvious that not only do they talk the talk, but they walk the walk as well, and I haven't looked back since. I've been through the pain of not knowing where you'll be able to find a job or who will take a chance on you, and that's why I'm leading this webinar today. Many of the tips that I'll talk about will be helpful for job searching no matter what the hiring landscape is like, but we're going to use the lens of the global pandemic for some of the discussion. In order to put this webinar together, the team here at Catapult has drawn from our combined 50 years of recruiting and hiring experience, including during the Great Recession of 2007. If you do have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to send them in through the chat feature. Since we have a lot of ground to cover, I will address all questions at the end. Okay. Let's get started. Before you even start to look at job listings, you need to spend some time thinking about who you are and what you want, in effect, creating your personal brand. The idea of personal branding is a little bit cliche, but honestly, it's even more important now that you have your brand ready to go. With unemployment at nearly 15%, the competition for each job is fierce, so you might be given less leeway than normal to make mistakes. If you're not familiar with the concept of a personal brand, it's the idea that you create and portray a distinct, consistent perception of yourself based on your experiences, your skills, accomplishments, and personality. When you're creating your personal brand for job searching, you want to work through a series of exercises to create one unified story of you. In order to have that cohesive story, you need to spend time doing self-reflection work through common interview questions and find personal examples and stories to use in future interviews. Work on your resume, draft a basic cover letter that can be converted to use in different applications. Clean up your social media, optimize them for your desired job where that's appropriate. And we'll go through each of these topics in a little bit more detail. This is the time to consider what you really want and how well positioned you are to get it. Plan to sit down for at least an hour and think back to your past experiences. Consider your skills and your personality. Some good questions to ask yourself are, what are your goals? What are your values? Do you wanna work in the field you studied or in something completely different? What experiences and skills do you bring to the table? What areas do you need more development in? What kind of impact do you wanna have and how do you wanna grow? Make sure to write down all of your answers so that you can refer back to them later. Next, consider what notable experiences you've had, whether it's customer interactions or conflicts with coworkers or a unique project you've completed. These are all potential talking points for your resume or interview. And remember, this exercise is just for you, so try to make it as detailed as possible so that you can have lots of information to fall back on. Next, consider what notable experiences you've had. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> remember, every job, internship, or class can be included here. Maybe you've worked at McDonald's and become known for your calm under pressure when dealing with upset customers, or you organize work schedules for group projects and that kept your team on track and ready for an A. Don't discount anything because it doesn't seem professional or the title isn't impressive. 
When you're searching for an entry-level job, the hiring manager will expect that you're drawing from a variety of different experiences and that you're finding a way to relate them to the job that you want. Now that you've invested the time into self-reflection, it's time to put all that information to work by going through common interview questions. There are infinite resources online for popular questions, including on Catapult's own YouTube channel. Once you start looking, you'll quickly find hundreds of potential questions, which can feel really overwhelming. However, the more you read through, the more quickly you'll realize that there are generally variations on a theme. You'll see questions about your goals, questions about why you should be hired and how your fit is going to be, questions about your experiences and your interests and personalities, and about your work style. You're likely to see some kind of oddball questions out there like, if you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be? Or sell me this pen. To prepare for these kinds of questions, it can help to think of them thematically once you get past the top 10 or 15 questions. That's where your self-reflection exercise comes in. We've put together four general categories of questions, fit, personality, behavioral, and uncommon or critical thinking questions. And we've picked the top five most common questions within each category. For fit-based questions, employers want to know how well you'll be able to do the job and mesh with the current team and company values. These questions are going to be things like, why do you want this job? Why do you want to work here? How do you handle conflict? As with any interview question, you want to answer these honestly and based on your self-reflection exercises. If you come across a fit-based question that you didn't answer in your self-reflection, take the time to work through it. Once you get to the interview, the types of fit-based questions an interviewer asks can give you some insight into whether the company is going to be somewhere you actually want to work. While we generally recommend saving questions for the end of your interview, feel free to follow up an interviewer's question with one of your own if the answer would change your interest level in the job. For example, if an interviewer asks you whether you prefer stable, consistent job duties or an ever-changing dynamic role, you should answer honestly, but feel free to ask if the job you're interviewing for leans strongly one way or the other after you've answered. Remember, the interview goes both ways, so it's okay to open a dialogue about something you feel strongly about. The next category is personality-based questions. These questions are relatively self-explanatory and they're designed to get to know you as a person. While all the categories of questions will reveal your personal brand, this one is where it shines the strongest. Make sure you're able to give clear, consistent answers that show what type of person you are. One thing to remember though, you don't need to give any information that reveals a protected status, such as age, pregnancy or family planning details, race, religion, sexual orientation, or political affiliation, among other things. If you are asked a question regarding these topics, it's okay to gracefully decline to answer or to give a very broad sort of non-answer and then redirect the conversation elsewhere. It's also okay to say something like, my age, political affiliation, marital status doesn't affect my ability to get the job done. Our third category is behavioral questions. These questions ask about how you have responded to certain situations in the past or how you would handle them in the future. The best way to prepare for these types of questions is simply to practice and to draw on examples from your self-reflection activity. These are going to be questions like, tell me about a time when you disagreed with your manager, or tell me about a time when you made a mistake. How did you handle it? When answering behavioral questions, it can be really helpful to keep the STAR model in mind. STAR stands for situation, what was the scenario, task, what were you responsible for, action, what did you do, and lastly, result, how did you contribute to the outcome, what did you learn, and how were your actions, how did your actions explicitly affect the result? You wanna make sure that you hit each point. A lot of times interviewees will forget to wrap up their answer with the result. By giving you a framework for your answer, the STAR model helps keep you from rambling and spending too much time answering a single question and make sure that you hit all the points your interviewer wants to know. We do have a video on our channel that goes over the STAR model in more detail if you wanna know more. The last category is a bit broad, and that's going to be unusual or critical thinking questions. These are questions that are designed to learn how you think, as well as a little bit more about your personality. The most well-known example of this is, if you were an animal, what would you be? But it's also really common to be asked to sell something, such as a pen, if you're running in the running for any kind of sales position. When working through this type of question, the actual answer isn't very important. 
what's important is the why or the process that you use in coming up with your answer. Using the animal question as an example, it's really common to get an answer like, well, I think I'd be a golden retriever. I had one growing up and I just think they're the best kind of dog. Not only does this not provide your interviewer with any kind of useful information, it also makes it look like you either didn't understand the question or you weren't paying attention. Remember, these strange questions are still interview questions and your answers should be consistent with your personal brand. A better answer would be something like, if I were an animal, I'd be a golden retriever. Just like a golden retriever, I love interacting with people and find that I can connect with just about anyone. Just like a golden retriever, I'm extremely loyal to the people around me and always think the best of people. I'm looking for a company that values that in its employees. The more practice you have answering a variety of interview questions, the more comfortable you'll be in an interview and the more solid your personal brand will be. Once you've gone through some questions on your own, it's a great idea to have someone you trust ask you some questions so that you can have practice giving answers to another person. If you're able, getting practice using a video interviewing platform is also a good idea since many companies have made the move to virtual interviews during the pandemic. Although it may seem that creating a personal brand is all about you, it can be helpful to research your industry or field so that you can incorporate the norms of the industry within your brand. Getting to know about industries can mean several different things depending on what your self-reflection identified. If you wanna target a specific type of job, like administrative assistant, project manager, social media marketing, start to think about what industries might hire those roles. You may find your options are wider than you think. Administrative assistants, for example, are found in Fortune 500 companies and sleek downtown offices full of hundreds of staff, but also in small towns in five person offices who just need help staying organized and on track. You might be working in the legal field or you might be more interested in filling that role in a trade company. There's no wrong answer to what's the best fit for you, so don't box yourself into any one field because you think it's the only one that you'll be able to get hired in. Even more specialized jobs like legal aid or grant writer might have position, positions open across industries. You need to take the time to figure out what that looks like before you start applying. While we generally recommend keeping your options open as far as industries, it can actually be helpful to identify specific areas to focus your search in. Take our first example, administrative assistant. As we just talked about, it's a pretty generic role and it's available in almost every industry. So is there a type of work you're particularly interested in? Some of the more well-known industries include banking, insurance, marketing or communications, trade, such as plumbing, electrical, landscape, logistics, recruiting, government, nonprofit, just to name a few. If something jumps out at you, get to know the industry. Once you've narrowed down your focus, take a peek at what's going on in the field. Is there a major merger in the works? Did a top company just replace its CEO? Has another company just announced a race freeze? You wanna know what kind of landscape you're trying to enter. If you're seeing a lot of buzz regarding layoffs or major C-suite turnover, you might wanna consider whether it's the right time to be job searching in that industry. On the other hand, you might see expansion announcements, the creation of new departments or products, or other indicators that the industry is booming. Right now, it's especially important to be on top of current events. As the world reacts to COVID-19, the hiring landscape is changing dramatically. You wanna know how the industry you're looking at is responding to the crisis and what effect the pandemic has had on their business. The other thing to be aware of is if you're gonna be competing with employees that companies already had to lay off for each position, you're gonna to wanna to know that in advance. You may also wanna know how well each industry has been able to move to remote work since we don't know when or if there will be another outbreak, being able to work remotely or being considered an essential service can be a huge plus. When you're starting to explore industries, another good idea is to try and get a sense of whether there's a, pers a particular personality type or value that best represents the type of person who works within it. For example, if you're interested in working in sales, Employers are often looking for candidates who are aggressive, money motivated, and persuasive. If you find that your ideal industry values traits that are not your strong suit, that's not necessarily a deal breaker. In that case, you would wanna be prepared to explain why your other strengths mean that you'll be successful anyway, or show ways to show your growth within the traits that are valued. The last piece of creating your personal brand is to tighten up your social media accounts. It may seem obvious, but 
It's critical that you take the time to get your social media accounts ready for your job search. For better or worse, the reality is that employers often take a look at the social media accounts of at least their finalists, and you don't want to lose out on an opportunity because of a controversial post you put out back in high school. Even if your accounts are all locked down on private, and they should be, you want to remove any controversial or non-professional content. That means photos of you drinking, in provocative poses or clothing, acting out, or posts with political topics. You never know when the hiring manager is going to want to know someone who's connected to you online, who can walk them through your account. The only social media account you don't want to lock down is your LinkedIn profile. Before you get too active in your job search, you should get your profile updated. And if you don't have one, I highly recommend that you start one. This means having all your past employment, extracurriculars, and volunteer work laid out with good examples of unique accomplishments. You should also have a professional-looking headshot and a well-written summary. I won't go too deeply into the details now of what makes a good LinkedIn account since there's a number of resources available online, including on our blog. But if you do have specific questions, feel free to ask them in the chat or email me later. Now that you've created your personal brand, it's time to show it off. When you're job searching, having a good resume is critical. It's essentially your way of introducing yourself to the company. You need to make a good first impression if you wanna be invited in for an interview and you have very little time to impress the person reading it. Most recruiters and hiring managers spend no more than six seconds on a resume before deciding whether or not they wanna move forward with the candidate. When you're searching for an entry level job, your goal with your resume is to make it very easy for the hiring manager to find the information they want and to show how you're an exceptional candidate. So how do you do that? Again, I'm not gonna get into all the details today because we could spend a full hour just talking about resume design, but I'll go through some general guidelines. Please keep in mind that these tips are what we recommend for entry level resumes. Once you have three to four years of professional work experience, you'll want to change the format. On an entry level resume, there's only two or three sections needed in the body. Start with your education. Make it easy for the hiring manager to see that you've graduated with your four-year degree since this is usually the minimum requirement for professional jobs. Once the hiring manager can check that off their list, they'll move on to other information. You want that to happen as quickly as possible to give them time to look at the rest of your resume. You can use this section to list any awards you received during college, such as Latin honors or these list. Next, you'll list your work experience in reverse chronological order. That means your most recent work experience is first. If you've had a lot of different jobs, you don't need to list all of them. Choose the jobs that are the most relevant to your job search. If you don't have any that are related to the field you wanna work in, that's okay. You can list the most recent jobs instead. This is the section where you would list any internships, work study opportunities, or traditional jobs. If you have no work experience, but you do have volunteer work, it's okay to put the volunteer work here as well. If you have a lot of work experience, but wanna put a volunteer position on your resume, you can put that down in the last section. The last portion of your resume is for campus involvement and extracurriculars. This is your chance to show hiring managers what you choose to do with your free time and give them a sense of your personality. Most hiring managers wanna see candidates who are motivated, driven, and who will bring something to the culture of their team. Different types of activities can also show different desirable personality traits. For example, having played on a sports team may indicate competitive drive, which is great if you're looking to get into sales. Multiple leadership roles may show your ability to prioritize and multitask, as well as a drive to succeed. Volunteering for a shelter might demonstrate community-driven values, ideal for companies where teamwork is highly important. You may have noticed that I'm not including any skills or course coursework in this resume. Unless you're trying to get into a highly specialized field where you need to show specific experience you gained through a project or have hard skills like coding languages or software proficiencies, these sections are most likely a waste of time since hiring managers won't be willing to take your word on what soft skills you have and they generally won't read through your coursework. The way you can communicate your soft skills on your resume is within the bullet points of your experiences and extracurriculars. Use the bullet points to emphasize how you gain skills in customer service, teamwork, communication, multitasking, etc. The points you generally want to hit are skill, task, and outcome. Start your bullet points with an action verb and make sure to use a variety of different ones. There are a ton of great lists online that can really help boost your resume. You can also use this space to talk about things that are exceptional about your time at any of your experiences. What did you do that went above and beyond the call of duty? A last few points about your resume. 
Keep in mind that many hiring managers like to print resumes and may not want to waste a ton of ink printing a resume with photos or graphics, as well as large blocks of color. These kinds of design elements also make it hard for software to parse your resume into their system, which might mean your information gets lost before the hiring manager ever even sees it. When saving your resume, always use a PDF format rather than a doc for the same reason. Some, um, some companies use different softwares, so you don't want to risk a hiring manager not being able to even open your resume. And remember, a good resume is there to get your foot in the door for an interview. You don't need to provide every piece of information about you. Once you get the interview, you'll have plenty of time to talk through what's not on your resume. If you'd like more resume tips, we do, or we will have a video on our YouTube channel that is exclusively devoted to them. So look out for that in the next week or two. While your resume may be pretty much the same for each application at the entry level, it's not the case for your cover letter. Each cover letter you send should be customized for company and the position you're applying for. It's okay to create a general template to use as long as you make sure that you proofread each one carefully. Before you start, research the organization and position you're applying for at least briefly. If they have their core values on their website, you can gain insight onto what types of skills or values might be worth mentioning. Start your letter with the name of the person you're writing to if you can. It's okay to call the company and just ask to whom you can address a cover letter for the position. A bonus to doing this extra step is that every once in a while, you'll actually be forwarded onto the hiring manager themselves, so be prepared to make a good impression just in case. The general structure of your cover letter should be, one, introduce yourself to catch their attention. You wanna have an engaging introductory paragraph to ensure that they read your entire letter. Tell them why you're interested in this particular company and this particular role. Outline what relevant skills you have and how you would use them for the company. And then close out their letter by thanking them for their time and consideration. Let them know that you're looking forward to hearing from them. You don't have to limit yourself to three paragraphs if you have more natural breaks, but do keep the letter under one page. Your cover letter should not be a recreation of your resume. Use this letter to tell the hiring manager about skills you gain through your work history and education that are relevant to the job you're applying for. Take care to give examples of how you gain those skills. Don't just tell them that you have them. For example, you might say, during my time as a server, I honed my communication skills by finding new ways to describe menu items and specials so that I could help even the pickiest eater feel confident that they were choosing items they would enjoy. By the time I left the restaurant, I was consistently the highest rated server on our customer satisfaction survey. Once you've explained the skills you want to highlight, tie that skill back to the role and outline how you'll apply it for the company. Lastly, don't use any gimmicks designed to grab attention, like telling a joke or including a dollar bill or unusual fonts. Trying to trick the hiring manager into taking another look at your cover letter is very obvious and it makes it look like you don't have any grasp of professional norms or like you don't believe your qualifications stand for themselves. It's often said that between 70 and 80% of jobs are found through networking rather than through a job board. With the unemployment rate being almost three times what it was a few months ago, jobs that are open are filling quickly. So building a professional network will allow you to be aware of new or upcoming opportunities before they hit the job boards. There are a number of different ways you can build a network, but the three we most recommend are joining a networking group, asking for informational interviews, and leveraging your personal network. Traditionally, networking groups provide you with the time to meet people in person, shake their hand, get to know a bit about their background and their level of experience. But with COVID, there's been a little bit of a pivot. Instead of going in person, the majority of networking groups have begun offering virtual events, allowing you to attend lectures, breakfasts, happy hours, all online. Because of that, you may never meet the people you're connecting. Know that that's okay. There are many different types of networking groups, and with the move toward virtual events, you aren't constrained by location as much as you might have been before. That being said, it's a good idea to choose a group with a chapter that's local to where you're job searching. From there, the groups range from huge national organizations to casual local groups that meet once a month for a beer. The type of job you're interested in, your industry of choice, and what you're hoping to get out of it should influence what type of group you choose. Spend some time thinking about what your goal is. Do you want a group that focuses on professional development? Are you hoping to break into a specific, difficult to join industry? Are you better suited to a group that's designed to help job seekers? Find some groups for each category and weigh the options. Some groups are free, others have membership fees. 
most groups will allow you to attend as a guest as a guest for at least a few meetings, um, either for free or at a low cost. Try a few before you commit. Not every group will be the right one for you, and it's okay to change. Even if you leave one, you still have the connections you gained there. Another factor to consider is how active the online community is for your group. Some groups have extremely active online communities where you can reach out with questions or referrals or requests and you get multiple answers right away. Others are not designed to support that. So if it's important to you, make sure that you reach out to the membership chair of each of the groups to find out what's available. The most important thing about joining a networking group is that you use it. Put in the effort to attend as many events as possible and talk to as many people as possible. Make sure you take down the names and companies of everyone you talk to. Once each event is over, connect with them on LinkedIn and send them a message expressing how much you enjoyed meeting them and telling them one thing you learned from their conversation. Ask if you can stay connected on LinkedIn. The follow-up is just as or more important as meeting people in the first place. It doesn't really count as networking if you don't maintain the connection. You may have heard about leveraging your personal network if you've ever explored any other job searching resources. All that means is you should reach out to your family, friends, former coworkers to see if they know someone who is hiring or who might be a good connection for you to have. Does your uncle work at a PR firm? Ask him if he can meet the CEO for an informational interview on how to break into the industry. Is your buddy's girlfriend's law office hiring an admin? See if she would put your resume in front of the hiring manager. Most of the time, the people around you would be happy to help if they can. Remember though, you're asking for a favor and they're spending some of their professional currency to act on that favor. If you blow off the interview or treat your new connection with, or fail to treat your new connection with appropriate courtesy, you risk not only harming your own reputation, but also that of the person trying to help you. Speaking of using your professional network to get informational interviews, let's go over what that means. An informational interview is an informal conversation with someone who works in a career that's of interest to you. You ask questions to gain information about a specific industry, company, or position. You'll notice that I didn't say that the point of an informational interview is to get a job or to find out more about an open position. If you try to use an informational interview to jump the line on a job application process, you will look tacky at best and deceitful at worst. This is your chance to learn more about an industry, company, or career. If the person you're meeting with happens to know someone else you should meet or an opening that might be a fit, that is a bonus. It's not a guarantee and you should not ask for it. With the pandemic, it is actually a really good time to be asking for informational interviews for many people. As the global community is pulling together, a good number of managers and company leaders are open to helping job seekers where they can. That being said, there's also a large number of people whose workload has dramatically increased. So if you get a negative response, don't be discouraged. Thank them for their time and try again with somebody else. So now that you know what an informational interview is, the question is, how do you get one? The easiest way is through your personal network. Once you know who you want to meet, see if you have any connections in common. If you do, and if that person is someone you trust, see if they'll connect you or if they'll let you name drop them as someone who recommended you reach out. In that case, you can send an email with the subject line like, Sally Smith recommended I contact you. If you don't have any connections with someone you'd like to meet, that's okay too. The easiest way to reach out is via LinkedIn or email. Before you reach out, make sure you already have a few questions ready since you never know when they'll be available and you don't want to be caught unprepared. When crafting your email, use a thoughtful subject line. For example, if they were featured in a blog or news article, you could try something like, I enjoyed reading your interview in Business News Today. Avoid generic subject lines like, hello, or informational interview request, as they may get ignored or just missed entirely. Be concise when writing your message. You want your interviewee to read the entire email, and that means you get two paragraphs at most, so avoid any unnecessary filler content. Include a brief description of yourself, which could include things like where you attended college, your last job or industry, where you live, or any connections in common. This is an ideal place to create some kind of link between yourself and the interviewee, if there is one. You also want to explain how you found them, whether it's a mutual contact or research, and acknowledge their accomplishments so that they know why you've chosen to contact them. Next, you should, you should directly ask for help. Be very specific about what you want. For example, I was hoping we could meet for 20 minutes to ask some questions about your experiences in human resources. If it's affordable for you, you might offer to bring them a coffee. And if they take you up on that, bring one for yourself as well. 
When you're closing out your message, it's respectful to acknowledge the other person's time is valuable and how much you appreciate your consideration of their request. Once you get the yes, make sure you work around their schedule and their location. They're doing you a big favor by giving you some of their time, so make sure you respect that time by being well prepared and taking as little of it as possible. Part of being prepared is doing a deeper level of research into your interviewee and the company they work for. Make sure the questions you ask are not readily available through a look on their LinkedIn profile or a quick Google search. The types of questions you wanna be asking are about their experiences, their opinions, their advice. Some quick examples might be, what did you find the hardest part of breaking into marketing? What does the day-to-day of being an HR generalist look like? What do you think is the most valuable skill I can learn to start a career as an analyst? Your questions should be personalized for each individual you talk to and based on what you actually want to know. Once you've gotten the interview scheduled and prepped for, relax and try to enjoy the experience. Get as much as you can out of the interview and then integrate the answers that you got into your job search. Lastly, make sure you follow up with a thank you note. So say you've done everything we just talked about, but the job you want just isn't available. Unfortunately, the hard part of job searching is that you have to be at the right place at the right time, and it's impossible to know what that is from the outside. That's even more true now than ever. Layoffs and hiring freezes are still very common, and the job market is likely to be tighter than it has been for some time. If the job you want isn't available now, there are some other things that you can do. The best advice we can give you is to stay active in your job search. Don't let yourself fall into a slump where you only send in one or two applications a week and you're sitting at home and letting your skills get rusty. When a potential employer asks what you've been doing since you graduated or since you ended your last job, you want to have a good answer for them. This doesn't necessarily mean you have to have been working. You could talk about events you've been attending through your networking group, such as a lecture on staying on task during remote work or how you've connected with various industry leaders. This might spark interest with your interviewers, so be prepared to give more details on whatever you bring up and relate it back to the job you're applying for. The number one thing you can do is continue to be applying for open jobs and networking, staying very active in your search since you never know what will work out. This means that not only are you applying to open jobs, but you're also following up on your application, doing your research for each interview invitation, and staying up to date on industry trends. Generally, we recommend that you're applying to 20 to 30 jobs per week during the application process. If you aren't finding enough open jobs to maintain that level of applications, consider whether you can broaden your search. Staying active in your job search can also mean that you work on continuing your professional education. There are many reputable online learning options that are available, whether you want to receive a formal certification or just learn a new skill. If you're waiting for the job you want to open applications, Spending time learning a relevant skill can be a great way to stay busy. Coursera, Udemy, and Skillshare are some of the options available, and courses are often offered at a low cost. While we don't generally recommend going back for an advanced degree unless you've already worked in your industry, there are times when it may be worth pursuing a master's degree rather than entering the job market, particularly if you're working in a field that requires a higher level degree early in your career, and it's not likely that you'll find an employer who will offer tuition reimbursement. If that's something you're considering, make sure you spend a good amount of time researching whether you'll actually benefit from the degree. Many times a master's degree can actually hurt entry-level applicants because hiring managers assume that you need to make too much money to be interested in an entry-level role. And if you get your advanced degree and later decide to work in a different field, that can cause hiring managers to question whether you really want the job you're applying for, especially without any context. Another option for continuing your professional education is to volunteer your time for a nonprofit organization in a way that uses the skills you're seeking employment for. Many nonprofits are offering virtual or remote volunteering opportunities, so take advantage of them. This allows you to build experience in your industry, add to your resume, and helps your community while you're seeking employment. It also allows you to get a feel for what it's like working from home, which can help to make hiring managers more comfortable with your candidacy over others. Here at Catapult, we've been getting a lot of questions about how to explain an employment gap due to the pandemic, and the good news is that you don't really have to. The vast majority of hiring managers are going to understand that many, many people will have some type of employment gap in 2020 due to COVID-19. Between shelter-in-place orders, high unemployment rates, and hiring freezes, it's completely understandable if you weren't able to get a job right after graduation or if you were laid off and didn't find something to take your old job's place. Don't let that be a distraction for you at all. That being said, if you're having a hard time finding a job you want long-term, it can be a good option to take a short-term gig-style job. 
This allows you to have an income and keep your work history active. It can also show that you're entrepreneurial and a hard worker. These types of jobs can be anything from shopper to warehouse worker, nanny to driver. Even if it's not the job you want, you'll have valuable experience to talk about in interviews and you'll be continuing to develop your transferable skills. Again, it's not gonna look bad on your resume to take this type of job. Hiring managers know many recent grads are taking or keeping whatever job they can while the economy is down and while they're looking for a job that allows them to use their degree. If you do get a gig job, it's important that you still remain active in your job search. Here at Catapult, we know that entering the job search is stressful at the best of times. Hopefully some of the topics we went over today will help you as you enter or continue your search in this unpredictable and unprecedented time. Please know that Catapult is here to be a resource for you, so feel free to reach out if we can be of assistance in any way. We are also offering by the hour job search consultations at a low rate to anyone who would like some assistance in their job search, but is not one of our active candidates. If you're interested in hearing more about that, feel free to email info at catapultnetwork.com. So now I'll open the floor for questions. So if you haven't already, feel free to send your questions in through the chat. Um, and I'll talk through as many as I can in the next 15 minutes or so. Okay, so one question that was emailed in before the webinar was, who can I use for my references and do I need to ask or tell them before listing them? Um, you can use anyone that you've worked with. Ideally, you'd have at least one manager and the other ones should be coworkers. If you don't have any coworkers, um, say you've never had a job before, you can use professors or um, if you have any volunteer experience, you could use anyone that you volunteered with as well. Do make sure that you tell them before you list them as a reference. If a hiring manager calls them and they don't know you've listed them, it's not going to look very good for you. Um, and anytime you are reopening a job search, just check back in with your references and make sure they know that you've re-entered your job search. Another question that had been emailed in earlier was, um, if I need time to think of my answer for a question that I wasn't prepared for, uh, how long can I take to think about it and how do I handle the awkward pause? So that happens a lot. Uh, the more you practice before your interview, the less likely it is that that's gonna happen at all though. Um, so first piece of advice is just to continue to practice. but. If that does happen, you get surprised by a question, um, as particularly some of those unusual ones, it's okay to just say, oh, I haven't come across that question before. Can I have a few minutes to think about it? Or um, ask if they can come back to it later. Like if you are thinking about it, you're taking 20, 30 seconds, nothing is coming to mind. Just say, honestly, I can't think of anything at the moment. Can we come back to that in 10 minutes? And usually, most hiring managers are going to be fine with that, but they will come back to it. So make sure that you're still thinking about it in the back of your mind.
All right, so I'm not seeing any other questions come through. So I think that we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. But if you do have any questions that you didn't want to put through in the chat or that you come up with later, feel free to email me um, any email at or e any email to info at catapultnetwork.com will get to me. Um, otherwise, thanks for attending and good luck on your job search.